Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you. Welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney, president of LPB. Well, this evening I'm with Bob Courtney, our volunteer moderator and somebody I know fairly well. Welcome, Bob. What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Beth, addiction experts and public policy officials alike are calling the crime and heroin use an epidemic. People are 40 times more likely to be addicted to heroin if they have misused prescription painkillers. Louisiana is ranked seventh nationally for the percentage of painkiller prescriptions. So how is Louisiana tackling this serious addiction epidemic? And what more needs to be done? Should authorities treat heroin as a medical or legal problem? How can we better understand what addicts and their families go through? Well, over the next hour, we'll explore these issues and more on opiates and the Bayou State. It is across the spectrum. It's all races, it's all ages. Um, the youngest case we've worked has been 18 years old, a uh, college student. Uh, the, uh, the oldest case, I think, was 67 years old, a retiree. Dr. Bo Clark is East Baton Rouge Parish's coroner. He says he's seen opiate addiction affect all kinds of people. We see it in people that don't have any money. We see it in pe you know, people that spend all their money on, on buying heroin. We see it in people that have, are very affluent and have plenty of money. There's really nothing that can describe what an opiate addict does. Addiction is essentially a situation in which your brain is actually hijacked. The emotional part of your brain gets confused with using drugs and survival and overrides the reasoning or executive functioning part of your brain. Dr. Louis Cataldi is an addictionologist. Travis Weisbrod is a former drug user. Even body nourishment, food, sleep, those things take a back seat when you're um, using drugs and you're in your addiction. The first thing that always comes first is, you know, the drug of your choice or getting high or whatever it is that you need to do. Clark says the number of overdoses has grown nationwide over the past several years. Between 2012 and 2013, the number increased sevenfold in East Baton Rouge Parish alone. Obviously, uh, a lot of concern because of such a large increase in the number. Uh, the following year, in 2014, the number shrunk to 28. And then this last year in 2015 was a record high of 41 deaths related to heroin toxicity. Louisiana has created the perfect storm for the heroin epidemic, Clark says. First, in an effort to keep nonviolent criminals out of prisons, lawmakers reduced sentencing for distribution of Schedule I narcotics. Other officials created a prescription database to put an end to doctor shopping. So when that happened, the, the number of prescription mar narcotics that were on the street uh, being diverted, meaning being sold illegally, uh, began to shrink. Uh, and so when they sh shrunk, then uh, there were people that were addicted to opiates started looking for other ways and means to get their opiate. It can be devastating to watch a family member struggle with severe substance use disorder. That's what addiction is called medically. To those around you, to your loved ones, it's the person that they thought they knew is there, they're alive, they're walking around, but their soul is like empty. There's not, there's like a whole, they're not a whole person. Weisbrod's little brother also went through treatment. It's a waiting game. You're afraid of that phone call. You're afraid of hearing what might happen to this person. Um, and it could be at, at any time. Uh, so it's, um, it's a lot of disappointment. It's a lot of somebody not showing up to Christmas or, um, somebody saying they're going to be at a place at a time and then they, they're not. I've known people as young as 17, 18 who have died. And if we could have helped reverse that overdose, maybe that kid could have become an adult, found out who they were, and maybe found their way in the world. Chelsea Rainwater is a part of a group called No Overdose Baton Rouge. She hands out a prescription drug called Narcan, also called naloxone. It's known as the anti-overdose drug. She also gives training on how to use it. 
Rainwater says her group is seeing a scary trend. A trend that we've noticed fairly recently is that a lot of users are afraid to call 911. So if they're with so if they're using with someone who is overdosing, they won't do it because they're afraid of the police coming, they're afraid of getting arrested. Rainwater's group practices a harm reduction philosophy. They want to help reduce the life-threatening consequences of using drugs. Hopefully that user can have a better chance at surviving his or her disease. There is the idea that users should just get clean. And people say that so freely and say it like you can just snap your fingers and it can happen. But I've seen it happen and a lot of the time people don't know how to do it. People don't even know what they, they don't know the steps that they need to take to make it happen. Trying to get out of addiction is kind of like going into a, a room and you think you know where the door is and when you turn around, it's just not there. Wisebrode now works for St. Christopher's Addiction Wellness Center in Baton Rouge. There, clients have the option of taking many months to complete the program. It lets addicts take the necessary time to rewire their thinking. Treatment includes the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The most important thing is that there's principles behind all the steps of being honest, of being willing, of being open-minded to new things. Those kind of things, if you live your life by those principles, I think if anybody does, not just people in, you know, who are in recovery, but things tend to get better for them. St. Christopher's takes what's called a co-occurring approach to treating addiction. Meaning that addiction has come from a secondary issue a lot of times or an accompaniment with another issue such as depression, anxiety, trauma. Many people with addiction have those other symptoms. Bipolarity. Brandy Klingman is St. Christopher's clinical administrator. So we're saying let's look at the whole picture and that means your mental health, your addiction, your physical well-being and wellness, so all of that together. You can be recovered. People, oh, I said the recovered word. Well, there's recovery and then there's recovered. I, I use them interchangeably, but this particular book I read says, talks about recovered. And I think you can be recovered. I don't think you, I think you have to be alert to the fact that you can reactivate your addiction. Getting sober was probably the best decision that I've ever made or the best opportunity I've ever been given. Um, it gave me my life back. I stay more active than I've ever been in my whole life. I get better sleep. You meet more people. It just opens a lot of doors that you didn't know were there. And uh, so, yeah, this is the best way I've ever lived, for sure. All right, joining us now to explore opiates in the Bayou State is our studio audience. It includes addiction counselors, including one from Shreveport, as well as family members who have been personally touched by this issue. We also have harm reduction proponents, plus two students from the Legislative Youth Advisory Council from Alexandria and Baton Rouge. Thanks to everyone for being here. First, let's take a look at some facts and figures surrounding tonight's topic. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, people who misuse prescriptions for pain relief are 40 times more likely to become addicted to heroin. Research from Washington University shows 75% of users seeking treatment started their opioid, opioid use with prescription pain relief. As far as the harm reduction philosophy goes, one study on communities in Massachusetts with naloxone programs shows the overdose rate dropped in those communities by 50%. Another study of users who visited a safe injection facility found that 57% later entered treatment. But how successful is treatment? The National Institute on Drug Abuse reports that the relapse rate is 40 to 60 percent. Even reputable 30-day treatment facilities say the probability of remaining clean and sober a year later can be only about 50-50. And according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, only one in 10 people with an addiction get treatment. That's including alcohol abusers. So let's start there. I'm curious uh, to find out from some of you what you think the single most important thing we can do from your perspective, what the community can do 
to attack this problem effectively. And Anthony, I'm going to start with you. You're a, you're a social worker, yes, so w w from your perspective. From, from my own perspective as a, as a social worker and as someone who's um, educated in mental health, I think the most important thing would be to look at this more at, from a mental health perspective than a criminal justice or legal perspective. And I think that would probably make the biggest difference, at least to get it to get the change started. Now, uh, Mildred uh, uh, Solar, you're you're here. You lost a son recently yes. to addiction, and you're here with your your son, the, the brother, Mike Champagne. What is from your perspective? What do you think we should be doing? I feel that we should be looking at addiction as a disease. Um, I, I don't believe that these addicts, as you would call them, uh, want to be addicted. Um, they would love nothing more than to live a healthy, happy lifestyle. It just doesn't seem to be in the cards for them. One of the things we heard in that piece before uh, th this segment was that sometimes people say, well, just stop. That, that's You've, you've lived with it, that's not possible. No, that it's not that easy. Um, my son did not want to be addicted. He has been through treatment numerous times and uh, I think depression gave way to that addiction resurfacing. Yeah. And uh, so it, it, it's, it's a problem. Let me, let me turn to you, Mike, from your perspective, dealing with your brother with this. What was it like? It was tough. It was, uh, you know, I was that guy, honestly, that, you know, I, I, I don't think that I have an addictive personality. And I was like, man, if, if you know, your daughter is not enough for you to quit, what is? Uh, and so I kind of, toward the end, you know, tough love, I guess, was the, the appropriate term. But I just, I couldn't stay close to it. Uh, but but I know that he was trying. He was looking for options, and the options are limited. When you you know, a you've 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 lost your job. You have no income. You have no health insurance. What are your real options? Go to the hospital and tell them, hey, I'm thinking about killing myself, so you can get in a detox. And that's it's it's sad if if you have no resources, and it's been a challenge. Fred Blanche, you've been there. Um, I, and, and dealing with your own problem, with your own addiction, I'm sure you heard many times people tell you, well, just stop it. Um, what was it like? You probably didn't want to do it either. Well, for a long time I thought I wanted to do it, but I'm pretty convinced that um, I was not sane during that period of time. They, they tell us that we, we need to be restored to sanity. Anytime you do something that trumps every other good thing in your life, your profession, your family, your values, and you do it over and over again, and then diminishing returns start kicking in, but you still keep doing it over and over again, there's something wrong with you. And thank God I got treatment and help and a lot of people to uh, support me along the way. And from, and from your perspective, Fred, what is the most important thing in your mind that we can do to attack this problem? Uh, I work in the treatment uh, business these days and the main thing we need is longer treatment, more treatment, treatment for poor people, uh, not just treatment for people who have good insurance plans. We need to have that treatment available to everyone and it needs to be a lot more than 30 days. Barry, I saw you nodding your head. You, you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, addiction is a problem of uh, not of stopping, it's a problem of staying stopped. Um, uh, there's some new research out there from the medical profession and I think there's more research needed as far as ways to approach this that are much more holistic. Um, um, it's, a, it's a very big problem at so many levels that uh, this kind of discussion is absolutely necessary to uh, inform the public. Diane, um, from your perspective, because this is something you're dealing with today, um, tell us, tell us what your opinion is about that. At this particular moment, I'm, I'm just, I'm just stumped because my son, it's, this has just been going on since 1995 and just a couple of weeks ago went, checked himself into a uh, toss center, you know, I'm about to commit suicide and it's like he knew he just needed to maybe just do this thing one more time and maybe this was going to be it and, you know, he gets out and 
I can just tell by looking at him, it's just not sincere. He's, you know, trying to get back on, up on his feet, and I feel like he needs to be back in a solid program, just like this gentleman mentioned. I mean, a, a, like a one-year, like, you know, not institutionalized, but something is just going to, you know, just something's going to click in his, in his mind. I mean, I've had to do the tough love for so long with him that I'm just, you know, I know families just get worn out with it, with the same old thing, you know. Um, I just feel like he just, uh, he wants it, but he doesn't know where, 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 where am I going to get it because I've burned out my fr friends and my family and no one wants to have anything to do with me anymore. So I don't really, I don't even have gas to put in my car. So, you know, wh what do they do? You know, they know there's no lifeline for them anymore. I want to turn to you, Chelsea. You, you were in the taped piece that we saw at the beginning. Uh, tell us a little bit about your perspective and what you're doing and, and the work that you're doing uh, and how it uh, impacts this. Um, I am a harm reductionist and at No Overdose Baton Rouge, uh, this organization was founded uh, to try and combat the, the rising number of uh, overdose, opiate overdose related deaths, especially in this area. And uh, so we started off just trying to provide naloxone, uh, which actually physically goes into the opiate receptors in your brain and reverses overdose. So if someone is overdosing on opiates um, and have this medication administered to them, uh, it will reverse the overdose. And we just thought if, if we could save lives, that would give those people another chance to possibly find a new way to live. And um, I strongly believe that there is more than one path to recovery. Uh, there's kind of a monopoly on this 12-step uh, abstinence-based treatment, uh, especially here in Baton Rouge. Um, there are other options, and I think uh, different people need different methods, and so I think we need more of that, more variation. Are you uh, an advocate for exchanging one drug for another? As, as there are certain programs where we give people certain drugs that, uh, that, don't, that make heroin, for instance, not really have any impact. They can take it, but it doesn't do anything. One of the things um, that I support is medication-assisted treatment, and um, one example is buprenorphine. Uh, that is a medication that uh, when taken regularly um, it prevents opioid withdrawal and it allows the person to get their life back to become a productive member of society and I think that's the main issue that I see uh, with drug use I mean aside from from deaths is that people lose their their quality of life and so if we could get rid of the negative consequences as a result of drug use, then um, I think we'd be doing something right. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much. We're going to get to you more uh, as, we, as the program goes along. That's all the time we have for this particular portion of the show. When we return, we'll be joined by a panel of experts to further explore opiates and the Bayou State. Welcome back to Louisiana Public Square. Tonight, we're discussing opiates and the Bayou State. Joining us now is our panel of experts. Dr. Rochelle Head Dunham is a psychiatrist and medical director for Metropolitan Human Services District, serving Orleans, St. Bernard, and Plaquemines Parish. She most recently served in the Department of Health and Hospitals Office of Behavioral Health. Victor White Sr. is a counselor with the Sin Law Community Awareness Program in Pineville. He has experience working for drug courts, residential inpatient treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, and detox programs across Louisiana. Logan Kinnemore is the founder of No Overdose Baton Rouge. He is a harm reduction advocate and a full-time pre-medical student at Louisiana State University. Keith Stutz is the District Attorney for the 15th Judicial District of the State of Louisiana, serving the parishes of Acadia, Lafayette, and Vermilion. He served as Chief Felony Drug Prosecutor for eight years. 
Before we go to our audience for questions, I'd first like to ask each of you to answer briefly. Has opiate addiction become a crisis in Louisiana? We'll start with you, Doctor. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be on the show because this is a very important topic for us to discuss, particularly with this audience. Uh, the simple answer is absolutely. Anything that replaces motor vehicles as the number one cause for death is for sure at an epidemic proportion and it deserves all the attention that we're giving it to giving to it on this broadcast. Uh, Mr. White. Yeah, I, again, I appreciate you all for having me as well. And I believe that um, it's been a problem. You know, we're starting to talk about it more because we're seeing more death uh, 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 as a result of it. But uh, from uh, my perspective, I've seen it's been a problem. Okay. Logan? Uh, yes, it's a problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I hesitate to use the word crisis, though, because I feel like that fuels stigma towards people who use drugs. And combating stigma and reducing stigma surrounding drug use is one of the missions of harm reduction. Um, we can't be rational. We can't make smart legislative decisions if we're being hysterical. So it is a problem that we need to address. And it's a problem that's killing people in the state of Louisiana. But I hesitate to use a word like crisis. That's an interesting uh, perspective. Uh, District Attorney, Steve. Well, the fact, <clears throat> the fact that uh, there are deaths from overdoses of any uh, substance, in including opiates, uh, does raise this notion that it is a crisis-like uh, scenario. It does require us to uh, give special attention to it because in, in the sense of law enforcement and the, in the sense of prosecution, there is a difference, I think, between addiction and a criminal. Um, and th this, the topic is, is very germane and very appropriate, I think, that we spend some time talking about it. Right, we're going to go right to our audience because we had a, a pretty lively and good discussion. Bill, I'd like to start with you. What would be your question for our panel? I didn't origi originally have one, but I do now. Uh, and I'm really interested in the uh, folks from the, um, tell me the name of your group again. No Overdose Benton. Yeah, the gentleman from No Overdose. Uh, I was trained originally um, uh, primarily using uh, abstinence-based models, and it's really interesting uh, for me to have discussions about uh, harm reduction models as well as some of the uh, medication-assisted treatment. So I guess my question for you, or because I, we only spent a few minutes earlier talking about uh, harm reduction and medication-assisted therapy. Uh, because I think it's something that's going to be very important for those that were really trained back in the day to deal with the uh, um, opiate crisis. So if you would speak a little bit, a little bit more about what you all are doing to address, uh, um, you know, whether it's heroin or any of the other narcotic pain medication. Uh, certainly. So, um, you know, for at least the last hundred years in the United States, the 12-step abstinence-only model has been our primary means of treating substance use disorders in this country. Um, and that is a model that is effective for some people. Um, what we have realized, um, as we've really looked into the neuroscience of addiction, and as we've started to investigate the effectiveness of abstinence-only programs, is that they're not enough. So medication-assisted therapy, as you mentioned, um, is very, very effective in allowing people to actually become productive members of society again. Um, you know, one of the, the most dire consequences of problematic substance use is your inability to function in society. You know, it distorts your, you know, your socioeconomic functioning. And so people who are on medication-assisted therapy can engage in 12-step programs if that is a fit for them. Um, or they can go to cognitive behavioral therapy if they're needing to treat some kind of other underlying, you know, emotional or thought disorder. Um, going back to school, you know, vocational rehabilitation, um, you know, vo uh, vocational counseling, going back to college. All of these things are made possible with medication-assisted therapy. Um, we see such a high incidence of recidivism, especially in opiate um, addiction and with people who have problematic opiate uh, abuse issues because the, the post withdrawal period is so long, um, speaking from a, you know, a neurological standpoint, it takes a very long time to feel normal again after quitting opioids. And most people just can't hack it. And no amount of, you know, 
just for many, many people. No amount of encouragement or support is going to alter their brain chemistry enough for them to sit there for six months and suffer. So medication-assisted therapy offers those people an outlet. I want to go to Don Hidalgo because I know you have a, a much differing opinion about this. You've been in this business uh, uh, helping people uh, curb <clears throat> their addiction, in their addictions and, and treatment programs for a long, long time, Don. 42 years to be exact. Uh, and I think I've seen just about everything, or all I want to see at this stage of the game. I think that the problem that you've got here is a statement taken from Alcoholics Anonymous that says, we're looking for a softer, easier way to deal with this problem. There is no softer, easier way to deal with this problem. One of the things that you have to do, in my opinion, again, and I'm in the process of doing serious research in a book on this one, is what's caused the, what's the foundation cause for what you, where you are tonight on this opiate addiction? Well, it's a multiple complex. Number one, there is a philosophy, there is kind of an attitude in the, with the American public today, the patient, that there is a magic bullet that's out there that will take care of any problem that you have. Give me the magic bullet. And so since we, uh, with all due respect to the, you physicians, you buy into this. In mm -hmm. many instances, the patient walks in and he says, I want, and he'll tell you or she'll tell you what the drug is that they want. Your problem then is to determine whether or not you're going to keep the patient or they're going to go somewhere else to find somebody else to, to provide the services for them. I think that it is a, it is a problem that has um, multiple tentacles and the solution is going to re require addressing all of those tentacles by everybody. I don't think the solution resides in any one identified source. Physicians play a role with this, um, mothers play a role with this, parents play a role with this, uh, social workers, we all, all of society has contributed to this problem in various ways and it's going to take all of society to fix it. What is the physician's responsibility? The physicians have to own and address it. But it's not a solution-based problem that is going to reside in one or two fixes. Everybody has to own their contribution to this problem in order for us to get our minds around it and to begin to fix it. I don't disagree with any of the solutions that have already been mentioned, except that I disagree that it doesn't involve everybody. We have two young people here on our, uh, in our audience, and I want to go, let's go to Manny first. From, from your <coughs> perspective, being in school now and seeing it from that perspective, uh, how, do you, how do you react to what you've heard so far? Um, actually, I've been thinking, I find it particularly interesting. There's like all these different methods how you can like cure opiate addiction, but what we've learned in health and the programs like that is that most drug use starts in school and from gateway drugs. And uh, for every, every one of those people who do, do drugs in high school. And like, there's nowhere for these kids to turn because to go to rehab, these kids have to tell their parents. There's no option for them to go anonymously and look for help. These kids aren't gonna tell their parents that they're doing drugs from an early age. It's just not an option for a lot of them. And then for the kids where they could tell their parents, their parents don't care enough to put that effort in. There's a very small percentage of kids that have that opportunity to go to a rehab. I'm not speaking specifically about opiates, but other gateway drugs that are very popular for the youth that are easy to access. So if you could find a way to prevent high schoolers from using gateway drugs, or at least give them an anom anonymous uh, a, a option for a rehab of some sort in high school, then it perhaps it could prevent, in the long term, a lot of people to get involved. You mentioned, uh, you talked a little bit about uh, motivation and, and kids going to their parents and fear, and we do know that there is a great deal uh, of fear on the part of uh, people out there, both users or people who know users, who are afraid of going to prison. And let's take it from the, from the, from the law enforcement standpoint. Uh, how, how can we tackle this problem uh, if people who you know, end up in a problem, don't want to report it because they're afraid they'll be charged? Well, that's a very good question that you pose, a circumstance that you pose, because I, I honestly think that it takes a, a radical re-socialization of uh, our, our upbringing, our socializing, our family life, mm -hmm. because, you know, law enforcement and the prosecutors are a negative reinforcement function. We, we only get involved 
in a negative way. We do not rehabilitate, and that is not our, our function. Uh, although I honestly believe that there is a, a, an area, a point of rehabilitation, every person, no matter what his um, offense, should be allowed an opportunity to, to rehabilitate. But by the time it gets to law enforcement, it, it's almost too late. It's almost too late for that to take place. Now, to answer the, the specifically the question, there was in 2014 several pieces of legislation that were adopted that provide protection to those who uh, bring someone to medical treatment in good faith. It protects both the person who brings that person to treatment, and it also protects that person who is over, who has overdosed from the uh, the possibility of being charged with the possession of that drug that they have overdosed or been part of. Now that, that was legislation passed in 2014. It's our version, I guess, the Louisiana version of the, the Samaritan law. Um, it, did, it did have, it does have some exceptions to it, but, but the, the primary force of it is to protect those who take that step, take that step to bring those, their loved ones, someone that they have uh, been associated with in the use of drugs in an overdose situation to medical treatment they be protected from prosecution. Logan, did people realize that we had this law, <coughs> though? Um, I'm, I, I was actually part of the team that helped get this law right. passed. Um, we do have this law in the books. Um, unfortunately, the law had to be amended to appease law enforcement who wanted to retain um, the power to prosecute people who called 911 on an overdose if they were the person that provided the drugs to the overdose victim. And furthermore, in East Baton Rouge Parish, there have been several very high profile second degree murder prosecutions against users who happened to be at the scene of an overdose who were sharing drugs with one another. And uh, this is something I did want to bring up tonight because in, uh, in law enforcement and in criminal justice and a lot of the talk, there's this distinction that's driven between distributors, dealers, and users. When the reality on the ground, like in the drug scene, is that most users sell small amounts of drugs to one another at different times in order to facilitate their drug habits. That's just how it works. So when we increase penalties for first time possession of heroin, a minimum of 10 years in prison without the benefit of probation or parole, and a maximum of 50 years in prison. Do you have to sell it to be charged with that? You yeah, you have to distribute it. Right. But again. But is, is distribution always selling, or can it simply be giving or sharing? Uh, I'm not an attorney. I cannot speak <laughs> to that legal distinction. But in the prosecutions in East Baton Rouge Parish, these drugs were not sold. They were simply shared amongst users. And when one person died, they get a second degree murder charge. These are high profile prosecutions in East Baton Rouge Parish. That disincentivizes people to call 911. And if we are truly interested in saving lives, if, if that's our goal here, if that's the program, to save people's lives, to give them another chance to go to 12 step meetings if that's what they need, to do MAT if that's what they need, if that's our goal, then we need to stop these overzealous prosecutions. We need to get Narcan in the hands of everyone. Every drug user needs Narcan. The mother, the brother, the sister, the father, the loved ones of every drug user needs Narcan in order to reverse a drug overdose. Um, and we need to stop putting people in jail who have drug problems. Yeah. Okay. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? <laughs> no, I, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but we, we do have to draw a distinction between what the prosecutor's job is, what law enforcement's job is. There is this element of discretion. I honestly believe, and I've said it earlier, that there is a distinction between an addict and a criminal. And that process, wherever it takes place, in East Baton Rouge Parish or any other jurisdiction, requires discretion to be applied, not only by the prosecutor, but by the court and by the judge. Uh, so though, though I don't disagree, I, I do have to make that point that we are in a different, we, we do have to follow the law, we do have to, imp, imp, uh, imp, it, impose the law that's given to us by the legislature. It is a matter of the, the legislature's will and the people's will that the law is as it is. In, in, in the 15th Judicial District, we have just a handful of cases. We have prosecuted individuals who have distributed drugs to those who have overdosed on those drugs, some cocaine, some methamphetamine, and some heroin. The ultimate justice in that case will be dealt by the court and by the judge. 
if it's fair and if it's appropriate, then we have to pursue it. Um, uh, again, there has to be some discretion about deciding who is an addict, the appropriate treatment for an addict, and who is a criminal and the appro appropriate treatment for a criminal. Corey, you got your hand up. Yeah, uh, I have two, two uh, mindsets on this. So first, the Good Samaritan Law, I'll read up on it a little bit. and. Um, it, was, it definitely has great intent to it, but like the biggest thing is the fact that it only stops you from getting possession charges. So they can still charge you with distribution and a whole bunch of other loophole charges if they want to come pick you up at the scene. And with that, um, it makes it a problem because all these like these still mm. charges I can still get, I can still get charged with them. And also on the um, overdose stopping drug, Narcan, Narcan, Narcan. Narcan uh, the problem with that that I've read up on is that a lot of people are thinking that if you have a ability to stop overdosing, it creates a problem that people no longer fear the risk of overdosing. So you so lose the, the, the fear, fear of death. overdose. You think is a deterrent? I think it possibly could be a deterrent, especially uh, other um, specialists think that as well. Now, personally, in my opinion, I think that Narcan could be distributed as well, but uh, it's definitely a deterrent to certain people that death it is. It's a real thing. I mean, people are definitely scared of death and they're taking heroin. It's definitely a cause for them to take only X amount of heroin, but I think that on the same, on the other side of the coin, is that there's a lot of these people like aren't scared of death already. Like people overdose multiple, multiple times, and they're not deterred by this. So I think the two side of the coin. I think we also have to look at the fact that Narcan could be a deterrent to that. Okay, I want to go to Kim. She had her hand up, and she hasn't spoken yet. Kim. I have not. I just wanted to say, um, I work in HIV, and I think that stigma is obviously, as Logan said, um, really at the basis or the root of why we can't look objectively at all of the potential uh, solutions to this problem. And I also have a 19-year-old um, a daughter who died of a heroin overdose on February the 12th of this year. And she did not die alone. She was with someone. And they did not call 911 because they were terrified of being arrested. And unless we can get that message in the hands of people who need it, then 19-year-old girls with their entire lives ahead of them are going to so continue you, to die. Yeah, your point is they were still afraid even though we have this law. Absolutely. Because they either weren't afraid, of, they weren't aware of Not it, aware or they didn't it. believe it. Right. I mean, th that's got to be a problem. I, I want to yeah. go to you, Mr. White, because mm -hmm. you're, you, you deal with this every day. Right, well, the, the same thing when they're talking about the overdoses, but I, I like the point about um, treatment. There's a lot of individuals that come to treatment, and then there are other individuals that don't uh, understand that treatment is accessible. You know, um, they say, I don't know, I'm going to get a bill. You know, when they mm -hmm. call, a lot of times people call, the first thing they want to know is how much we're going to charge them. You know? See, so, uh, and, and, and when you tell them, no, well, you don't have to pay, the thing is, is that when they're in a the crisis, they want to come to treatment. Come to treatment within 72 hours, the crisis is over, everybody ready to leave. I got to go to work. Mm -hmm. My family needs me, and this, and then, uh, and, and treatment since uh, since we're under managed care now, uh, 14, 21 days, you know, and so knowing within a 14 day range, you're just breaking through the things that they got, you know, that that's been going on. If it's been 10 years, five years, that this stuff has been going on, we just getting through it. And so with managed care, they said, well, no, not even ready to step down. So you really have to get on the phone and go with that. So a lot of time we're not. Now, even dealing with uh, the client, patient, or whatever at this point, a lot of times we're on the phone with managed care. And it's not free. Most treatment is not free. Well, so it costs money. Uh, obviously, it costs money. Right, Don? I mean, uh, I have a, 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 an actual case I want to describe, for you, which I think kind of sums up how I see this thing. It's an attitude and it's a public perception of the question about just say no. If, is it an illness or is it not an illness? And we've not convinced the public 100% yet that they we're dealing truly with an illness. We got a phone call one day from one of our offices over in Atlanta. This woman was a 25, was a 35-year-old female executive working for this company, part of five members of an executive team. She got drunk three or four times in, with, in front of her uh, senior management team. And so her boss said, obviously, if she's getting drunk here, she's got a problem, so send her to the Employee Assistance Program. She comes to see our office and she tells our counselor, she says, I, uh, I've been struggling with this problem for three years and I've been wanting to come, but I couldn't get up enough courage and I was too ashamed. But I knew if I got drunk in front of my boss, he'd say I was an alcoholic and send me here. My problem is not alcohol. And with that, she rolls up her sleeve and she's got track marks all over her. Now, this woman was 35 years old, MBA, 
$250,000 a year in income. She is not the prototype of what you think of a drug addict, no particularly problem. a heroin addict. When I said she rolled up her sleeve and showed the track marks, the attitude changed 100% from the fact that she was an alcoholic and now is a heroin addict. It's because so, it's more socially acceptable to be an that's alcoholic correct. than it is to be a heroin And addict. we haven't done the best job in the world about... In, in, well, that was going to be my next public. question. Isn't this really about public awareness? Go ahead, Eugene. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I think uh, Logan spoke to her earlier when he said about the word crisis. And when, you, when we use those type of terms, we can not on purpose add stigma to certain un, you know marginalized populations and this would certainly be one we have to start thinking of this as a public health concern a public health emergency and taking public proven public health evidence-based approaches to solving this problem fact-driven approaches it, it, you know much too much in our community we base what we do in serving people on opinions rather than fact good you know, hardcore data, this is how you solve this. We're not taking that approach. So, you know, just the, that very word crisis shows the very disconnect between the social side and the legal side that we have to come to some type of middle on if we hope to fix this problem. Because until we do, we're going to inadvertently add this stigma on top of this population that's already has so many. We haven't even talked about the social issues that differ from population to population. You can't reach the 35-year-old MBA person like you would the 21-year-old African-American male out of 70806. It has to be two different approaches. Yeah. It's no cookie-cutter approach, and it has to be some proven, evidence-based public health approach. Well, maybe this is a public more health than concern. just two approaches. There yeah. need to be multiple <laughs> approaches to that. Um, Corey, I want to bring your mom in because she, she's uh, a district court judge. And um, by the time people who have problems with drugs and alcohol get to you, sometimes it's way too late or, or, or it might also be the turning point for them to actually deal with this problem. My comments would be similar to district attorney Stoops, which is that by the time they do get to us, we have a role to play. Uh, the judiciary's taken a lead, but Im imagine this, from the date of arrest to by the time they actually get to our doors, six months. And so there, it's the crisis is sometimes there or not there, but what courts have been doing is doing a lot of problem solving courts. So there's, we're recognizing there's co-occurring issues where it could be mentally health driven as well as some other issues. And then drug court is really out there where you still got the hammer of jail as a response because like he, he directed, by the time they get to us, the families are begging uh, people to please leave their son in jail so that they'll be alive. Their families have, uh, you know, been burglarized, they've had all their items stolen and taken, and they are just at their wits end, and so they beg us to leave them in jail. So it's a really awkward thing. Or they've been in and out of treatment facilities, and so it's tough. Just today, I've had that same, it is every day. I'm sure he's saying the same thing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a, my preference would be, you know, if there's a wish list, and I think that's even one of my questions, is what can we do before they ever call law enforcement? Because they call law enforcement, and all law enforcement can do is arrest, and then all if you get that far, then we just leave them in jail because we do not have the ability. And I've worked with Mr. White and I know Dr. Dunham as well. It's like, then we're waiting for a bed. So we will tell families we're gonna leave them in the jail, which is not a detox center. And we've had individuals die within our jail facility because jails are not hospitals. They're not designed and you, they're not honest about what they're on to the jailers either about what they're on and what they're capable of. Well, speaking of, of detox centers, Dr. Dunham, do, um, do we actually have enough treatment facilities, enough beds for people mm -hmm that are dealing with this problem if we if we did start getting them to come in yeah you know that the this question of do we have enough um, the simplest answer is no we don't have enough uh, but in truth um, our reliance on certain things creates the problem more of not enough and what I mean by that is um, people who do well in treatment they do well usually because they have wrapped around them a number of different services, supports, employment, living, a place to live, um, a supportive social community. You mentioned the social implications of this. All of those things are necessary to help the person survive the brain illness, which is chronic, which is relapsing, and which will always plague their lives if they don't have the supports to sustain them over the course of their lives. So we tend to think of substance use and those who suffer from it as an episodic condition that you provide episodic interventions for. And in truth, 
you don't do that with diabetes. You know that you eventually, a yeah, it's problem. a chronic relapsing condition in part by definition. It's a neuropsychological, neurobiological, psychological condition that has a number of different deficits associated with it. And you have to address all of the components of that deficit state. So a person goes to jail. Part of it is because untreated addiction usually results in criminal behavior. It's not that they are necessarily criminals, to your point of separating the two out, but sometimes they are, right? Because there is the core occurrence of psychopathology with addiction. And so they go into the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system says, well, you know, that's not what we do, with all due respect. But in truth, they're there. So what should you do? And many will say, I mean, there's research to support that therapeutic communities in prison systems are very, very helpful to people while they're there. Then people say, well, where's the money going to come from for that? Well, where's the money in the health care system? We're having budgets slashed right now um, in the legislature because health care and education, as you know, bears the burden of balancing the budget. So nobody really has the money, so what do you do? And I revert back to my original statement that the solution is in everything that we do, every part of what we do. If we touch that person's life, we are in some way responsible in part to wrapping around a solution for them. Harm reduction plays a role, 12-step plays a role, medication plays a role, inpatient treatment plays a role, detox plays a role, but housing plays a huge role, I got a job now, plays a big role, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not stigmatized anymore, plays a role. All of that is necessary. We are baffled by this condition because it is extremely complicated and the solutions re result, re require a complex set of solutions that are wrapped around the one person to help them recover. Um, otherwise, people continue in this vicious, chronic, relapsing cycle until they die or somebody else dies. And, and crisis, I think calling it a crisis is a way for those who are struggling with this condition and the loved ones that they've lost or have worked to raise awareness to it. It may be further stigmatizing it, but it's an attempt to really get somebody's attention. That's a good because point. Because in, in this world, it is low on the totem pole in terms of what should we really be concerned about. Addicts, not really. They made the choice. They suffer the consequences. Yeah. That's what most people think. We so we, we do call it that, I think, in part, to give it some spotlight and give it some importance. We're, uh, when you're talking about the beds, no, we don't have enough beds. If you look at Red River Treatment Center, Red River Treatment Center within the last four years, since 2011, it was 86 bed facility. Now we're down to 30, 37 beds. Managed care comes in, you can't afford to do what you used to do and provide quality of care. Uh, Briscoe Treatment Center, 56 beds. It was 56, 56 bed facility. Now this year itself, right, it's down to 27 beds. Right, Detox, Red River Treatment Center, 2011 to 2015, I think we lost the uh, detox. We had a 12, uh, before it was 20 and went down to 12, now there's none. See, so those beds, right, so where are those individuals? When we're talking about treatment uh, 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 being accessible, where are those, where are those individuals? They've got uh, Cabrini Hospital, but they're not uh, detoxing, not medical detoxing. Go down one day, to give them something, say go home. Uh -huh. See, now there's a three-week waiting period for a bed. Well, it was a three-week waiting period. Now that we lost 20-something beds in one facility and 30 beds at the other facility, right, now you're looking at four six weeks before a bed even a, a bed. And why have you lost the beds? Well, budget uh, cuts? And budget cuts, correct. Budget cuts, and again, like I said, and then uh, uh, they're actually trying to do the, the same care on less money. Gotcha. And, and so, and, and not only that, I, I, even with that, right, the staff, we lose staff. I lost staff like that. Mm -hmm. so, so when they cut, then the staff gone, the nurses are gone, and all these things are happening. But, you but, know, and I appreciate what Logan said about crisis stigmatizing, but sometimes <coughs> you need the word crisis to get some people's attention, yeah, yeah, especially yeah. like in the legislature and government. That's the only way you're going to get that's their the attention is to, is, to, is to let them know it's a crisis because that's all they react to sometimes. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the fact that the beds have been cut 
the way they are, and medical treatment has been cut the way it has. But that's the crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is the that crisis. Is the crisis. Yeah. That is the crisis. Okay, Tara Washington, you've been sitting here for a long time. You've been very quiet. You have a question. Yes, well, I have a really a statement. I just think that as a school counselor, I think, and you use the word awareness, I think awareness needs to be more proactive instead of reactive. As a school counselor, I'm seeing an increase of students, even as young as elementary school students, um, you know, becoming addicted to drugs. And it's very alarming to me. And when I am talking to parents and they're asking me for help, I, I need resources. I need, um, I need this awareness to be more proactive where we are educating our students on the dangers of drugs. We are educating them as the drugs get more dangerous. They are, um, I just recently heard that they are cutting weed now with Mojo. You know, they are doing, the drugs are just becoming so dangerous and students think now that they're smoking weed, but now they're actually smoking weed cut with Mojo. And the side effects of that is just so, life or death for uh, my students. So I really would love to see more proactive programs and just more resources for parents because I think if we're more proactive with parents, then they can have these conversations with their children and, about and, the danger. And for our viewers out there who don't know what Mojo is, it's a synthetic form of marijuana? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, we're, we're kind of getting to the close here, and I'm just wondering if we could really quickly go down the panel and just kind of summarize what your biggest concern is, Doctor, or, or, the, or the most important thing you think, uh, given all we've said now and what you've heard, what should we do? Well, I, I, I really think that um, we have to really help society understand its contribution to this problem. Um, by increasing awareness, uh, because one way that one thing that we have not done in the world of um, behavioral health treatment in general, mental illness treatment and addiction treatment, is we have not really done a great job of marketing what we do do, and we certainly have not focused on the successes we have, because everybody who has the disease of addiction. Um, does not not recover, if you will. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of success stories out there. Part of our problem with getting funding is we don't promote our successes. We do a great job of talking about our failures and the failure of people who suffer from this disease, but we don't talk much at all about all the successes we have. There are successes sitting in this room yeah. right now. That's so right. I think we need to work more on that. Um, well, I, I think we still need to go back to lower treatment longer time in treatment and being able to work on other issues co-occurring as I said I think that's something that we really don't uh, 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 hammer on when they come in because the, it, it, before in the old days it was, you came in as substance abuse you had mental health issues and you still see a lot of individuals that uh, from that old school they're still doing the same thing so so I still believe that uh, even we as professionals we still need to get some other education yeah it's and it's not there are no quick fixes Correct. And there's no magic bullet either, as Don referenced. Logan? Um, I'd like to address our representatives of, of jurisprudence here briefly um, with a solution. Because um, both of you talked about having difficulties in criminal justice with finding solutions. Uh, there was a program in Seattle, Washington that was started in 2009, and it's called a LEAD program, which stands for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. And this is a pre-booking intervention program. So when uh, a law enforcement officer comes into contact with someone who has committed a low-level drug offense, the law enforcement officer has the discretion to take them to jail and book them and put them into the six-month system or to immediately connect that person to a counselor who assesses them for their socioeconomic needs, for their recovery needs, their treatment needs, and connects them immediately to that care. Um, and this is also a harm reduction based program, so non-abstinence is not a non-starter. Like if this person stumbles, they don't stay abstinent, they don't immediately go to prison, they continue to receive care. Any positive change in a person's life is a good change. And briefly, again, this program found that 58% of the people who were in, in the LEAD program as, as compared to a control group, uh, there was a 58% reduction in recidivism. These people were not arrested again. From 2009 until a study was performed by University of Washington in 2014, 58% drop in rearrest. It's cost effective. It's so much cheaper than sending people to jail. 
it's even cheaper, that, cheaper than inpatient treatment, and it works to keep people from engaging in problematic behaviors. Right. So that is a solution that we have on the table. By virtue, District Attorney Stutz, of your position on the panel, you get the last word. <laughs> As always. <laughs> uh, I guess I've been trumped by Logan, but uh, I, I do agree that I think the one of the solutions, I mean, there are two solutions. One solution is to grab the children at the youngest age and find out why they get addicted, why they start with their addictions. And, and that would take uh, reevaluating our whole social structure and how we raise ourselves, how we raise our families. The other is it's going to take a master collaboration. This, this program in Seattle is not just a collaboration between the DA's office and the police. It is the resources of an entire community. Mm -hmm. So it's a collaboration of an entire community. And you have to train officers in how to use it. Not only officers, but there have to be yeah. there has to be those resources available for mm -hmm. the treatments, the referrals. It's it's a master project. Now, yes, in the large sense, it is cheaper to engage in that type of project, but that is a massive project. It, it's it's uh, it's uh, enormous. But that may be the solution. Is a um, collaboration of all of the parties that have some effect if eventually on addressing addiction. Okay. Well, we've run out of time for our questions and answer segment. We'd like to thank our panelists, Dr. Head Dunham, Mr. White, Mr. Kinnamore, and Mr. Stutes for their insight on this month's topic. When we come back, we'll have a few closing comments. Well, Bob, this um, evening we certainly heard some personal stories that were very dis distressing and troubling. And um, also we've understood how complicated this topic is, and it's one that we really have to deal with. Not only do we have to deal with it, we also learned that there are many parts to this solution, not one fix, not one cure. And it's going to take a lot of coordination, a lot of public awareness, and a lot of people working together mm -hmm. to, to make this happen. And certainly a length of treatments is an important time as well, yes. uh, expanding that, I think. Well, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you. Uh, that's all the time we have for this edition of Louisiana Public Square. We encourage you to visit our website at lpb.org slash public square. And while you're there, take this month's survey, view additional sound bites, and comment on tonight's show. And we'd love to hear from you. Well, certainly next month's Louisiana Public Square will delve deeper into a topic many Louisianians hold dear, veterans coming home. Louisiana joins 11 other states with the second highest percentage of veterans aged 25 and under. The needs for these younger veterans as they return state to upside are plentiful, including securing civilian employment, obtaining health care, and oftentimes housing and addressing the mental rigors of transitioning from military to civilian life. Tune in Wednesday, May 25th for Louisiana Veterans Coming Home. And thanks for watching this evening. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Support for this program is provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and from viewers like you.